Um, the average venture capital firm, by definition of being average, is not very data savvy. Uh, yeah. That's probably why they're average. Um, you know, I think what you'll see with average firms is they'll look at something like app store downloads or web traffic, and they'll be like, "Ooh, graph goes up." You know, let me. That's uh, that, that's a good company, up. and and they'll like call that data science, and then they'll come up with some narrative about how they have a tool that helps them do this, and they'll. You know, it's good marketing to help separate LPs from their capital. Um, and then for those average VCs, like those LPs will never see any of that money back. Um, I think we have the benefit at CBI of working with like what I would regard as many of the top venture investors. And I'd say it's not the VC as an asset class is sort of expanded. So it's, you know, it's the traditional VCs, but you've got corporates, you've got hedge funds, you've got sovereigns, you know, there's got mutual funds. So there's a bunch of really it's a more eclectic group, but I think some of them are using it in really data and intelligent ways, but I'd put them in the above average category. Um, what's, what's an anecdote of like an investor that's used data in a super intelligent way? Yeah. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So if, if I break down how the VC process works, it's sort of the circle of life is see the deal, assess the deal, win the deal, nurture the deal, right? And mm -hmm. so those are, I think a lot of the focus tends to be on seeing the deal and that tends to be you know, let me find the signal. And if the bar, the line chart goes up, that's a good company. Um, so I'll give you a couple of examples of seeing the deal. The one I like the most, which I, which one of our customers I know does very religiously. And I, the term we use internally or the term I use is lineage tracing. So what they do is they're obsessed with all the deals they didn't see that they wish they had seen. So what they will do is they'll use us and they'll look at their peers who did a deal, let's call it a seed or series A deal. And they'll just do a comparison of what companies those, you know, their peers had done that they had not had mm -hmm. in their own CRM. And then what they'll do is go back and look at, okay, who was the, where did that company come from? Did it come out of this accelerator? Was it funded by this angel investor? And they'll, you know, they'll use CBI to figure that out. And then what they'll try to do is go build relationships in those areas so that they, that never happens again. Right. Yep. And so I think like, that's a really you know, they're a top tier fund and they're like still humble enough to know or humble enough to say, hey, we miss stuff and it makes us mad when we miss stuff. And so they kind of go back and do this all yeah, the time. It's like, it, it, you can't be in the deal if you've never seen it, if you don't exactly. even see it in the first place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think, you know, but elite firms sometimes might feel like, well, I see the best stuff. Right? Yeah. I thought this was like a really rigorous way of making sure you never miss. So like, you know, this kind of going back and figuring out the lineage, I think is really interesting. I'd say the other way is that people use data to see the deal. One is like from a thought leadership perspective. So yeah, Matt Turk at First Mark, right? Like they just came out, with, he came out with this crazy AI landscape, right? And use CBI data for that. But I think that's a really interesting way of, um, you know, kind of being this lighthouse for founders and companies in a space to say, hey, listen, we know this space really well. We really care about it. And then, you know, using kind of data and thought leadership to attract the right types of founders for you. And then, you know, we, when we see customers doing stuff with our data like that, we love it, obviously. And so then we'll distribute it to our newsletter, which goes out to 600,000 or so folks. So, you know, hopefully we can amplify that. So I think that's another thought leadership way. Um, and then I'd say- Just content marketing, essentially. Yeah, yeah. But like using- you know, data to say like, hey, we care about this market. And we've spent time to understand it. And here's some things we've t we've seen. And I'd say the final would be using what I would call non-traditional signals or mashing up traditional signals with non-traditional signals. So uh, looking at things like commercial transactions. So who, which companies have a lot of vendor partnership, customer signings, um, headcount growth, uh, coupled with maybe, you know, when they last raised. Uh, we have some scores around like management quality. So, you know, I think folks will use that data. They'll maybe combine it with existing data they have, and maybe they have their own model. Um, those are, I think, interesting ways of seeing the deal. Um, then if we shift to like- What type of data, like on a company, do you wish you had, but you just, you know, it's just too hard to get or something like, gosh, so oh God, if we could only have this kind of data, like, or people have asked you for this thing, but it's just incredibly difficult to get. Yeah, probably the one that folks ask about is market share, right? So within a space, 
uh, let's say there's 10 players, right? Mm -hmm. You know, who's rising, who's falling. Yeah. yeah, And how is that trending over time? Right. And I think there's some interesting- It's really hard to get that. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. Really. And, you know, so- yeah, like it's sort of like a, a measure of velocity and traction. So there's props. Yeah, back in the day, like if you were like, you know, if you're selling like an ATS to a company, you could like crawl all the companies and see if it's on the website. But if it's like an internal dev tool or something, there's no way to crawl that. There's no way to know, except, you know, maybe you like check for like new connections on LinkedIn and oh, they made a connection to Macy's. Maybe they're selling to Macy's now or something. Yeah. So we have commercial transaction data, which says they're selling to Macy's, right? But what we don't know is, you know, was how big of a deal was that, right? How do you have that data? How do you, how would you know? Because you like, you survey? Yeah, so we do two ways. We get what we call them analyst briefings. So companies will submit information to us about their customers, and then they'll we'll validate that with the customers. And then we also will crawl uh, media, their websites, and identify you know press releases talking about uh, X Y Z just signed with McDonald's, and you know it's a POC or it's a full blown deal or it's a partnership. So we collect all of that data. So we have. What we try to do when data like market share is really hard to get, we try to say, okay, what are proxies for it, right? And so mm-hmm. that's a proxy for it, right? If we see that coupled with headcount growth, coupled with top tier investors, you know, we do interviews with software buyers. So if we see that, you know, the CSAT scores in those interviews are high, like those are all indications of something that's good. And in those interviews, we'll often ask, hey, uh, who else did you evaluate? Right. And so we get a sense for at least who's winning in the deals. Right. Again, it's mm-hmm. not exactly market share, but you know, when you take all of these things and combine them, I think you get a pretty complete view of what might be happening with the company and with the market. It's interesting because a lot, a lot of these vendors kind of go together. So people who buy this vendor tend to buy this other vendor, even though these vendors may not have any type of partnership or any type of thing. Like if you look at like a DNA strand of a company, if you just looked at all the vendors, like every company is unique, but they they can kind of slightly rhyme with one another. And I, I imagine it could be like quite predictive if like if you could see company A is doing really well. Um, and you know, like, okay, company B is usually like one year later selling to the company, yeah. same companies as company A, yep. then that might be also a good time to invest in that. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, what we've actually seen there is it is really predictive of M&A, right? And so what we actually find is uh, some strategics that have just have a tendency to sort of try before they buy. And so you'll see a partnership or a Right, Salesforce, for instance, almost yeah. always partners Salesforce, yeah. before they buy exactly, the company. Yeah. Salesforce, there's a bunch of healthcare, you know, pharma companies that do that as well. And so we'll see that pretty regularly where it'll be a, if you, you know, you'll see a number of partnerships sometimes with, you know, one strategic, you know, within a category. So maybe they're trying a few different players out. So you now are starting to figure out, okay, they're likely to make a move, at least in this category. And then sometimes what you'll see is one of them went from proof of concept to full blown deal. And then that probably becomes your favorite for a future acquisition. So yeah, there's a bunch of things like to your point around things that get bundled together that you could look at. I'd say like our customers tend to look at that information from the perspective of predicting future M&A and predicting kind of competitive strategy a lot. Um, So yeah, it's really, really useful from that perspective as well. 